Please be seated. I'm going to say a couple of things just before we move across to the baptism. And I'm going to come back and talk about the story of David and Goliath. But um, in case you're wondering, no, those readings were not chosen for the baptism. They just happen to be the set of readings we have set for us today. So the backstory there is that when we gather for church on Sunday, over the course of three years, we work our way through a cycle of readings, which we don't pick. So you're not just getting the Dean's favourite passage week after week after week. Um, so we probably wouldn't have chosen the chopping off of the giant's head or the stilling of the storm or whatever for a baptism service, but they're the readings we've got, as it turned out, today. In the case of... Uh, so let's go to that, that classic story of David and Goliath. Um, and even, I mean, the phrase has become part of our language. That's a real David and Goliath situation. That's a standoff. And we talk about perhaps uh, conflict between a, a highly ranked sporting team and a, a club that's near the bottom of the ladder. When they meet, it's a David and Goliath kind of game. We might talk about a struggle between a a really powerful company with lots of resources is pushing in. Um, certainly, I think I've heard it when a, when a new sort of Woolworths moves into a small country town, people talk about a David and Goliath struggle between the little shopkeeper and the big supermarket chain. We know that kind of dynamic. You might talk about the conflict between China and Australia as a David and Goliath. And perhaps most ironically at all, in Israel and Palestine, it's the Palestinians who have, are throwing stones while the Israelis have the weapons and the armour and so on. And we can see that disproportionate um, um, sense that one side has all the power, the other side has lots of passion, but not much in the way of equipment. And if that story, that story I, says, I think it... It connects with another kind of um, theme or meme that's around in our community where there's a sense in which we say, you know, we all know the saying, might is right. If you're powerful enough, you can do what you want. And the story of David and Goliath is actually saying, actually, no. Sometimes what is right overwhelms what has power what has all the assets on their side. And that's certainly the, uh, the case in this strange kind of story we've got. And the, for me, the bit that stands out at this stage of my life, as a kid, it was the, the little boy going down with a handful of stones and killing the giant. And I loved that gruesomely, I hate to admit. I loved that picture in the children's Bible with Goliath stretched out on the ground and David holding the giant's head in his hand, a, a gruesome and horrible scene. Kids love those kind of fairy tales, of course. But what catches my, my eye now is the irony of Saul trying to fit David out in the Saul's armour. Let's just unpack that a little bit. Saul himself was no midget. In an earlier story, a few chapters earlier in 1 Samuel, when Saul is chosen to be the king of the tribes of Israel, he's described as being head and shoulders above everybody else in the country. Very bird. <laughs> he was a tall guy. He stood out in the crowd. He was you know, this much higher than everybody else um, in the line. So here's Saul, who's, who's no midget himself, but he's totally cowered by an even bigger guy a big bully, Goliath. And then along comes David, who's just a kid. He's not old enough to get called off to battle when all the other men from, Beth, from, the, from the, uh, his, hometown of, um, his hometown of Bethlehem, when they all go off to fight the battle, David's the kid who gets left at home to look after the sheep. He's a scrawny little kid. Okay? You see how the storyteller is getting the story going. So David's there, 
not even shaving yet. Saul is a big guy and he's trying to put all of his armor onto this kid. It's not going to work. I mean, we know it's not going to work. And by the time it's finished in that little episode, David's going, well, thanks very much, king. Like, I can't do anything now. I can't move because of all this stuff you put on me. So he has to, he peels off the armour and he goes out to meet this other person, this incredibly awesome and freakily scary guy, just as he is. So the storyteller has set it up. And we, we know how this, we, we've all heard the story before. We know how it's going to end. What do we do with a story like that on a morning when we're going to baptise a beautiful little girl who probably is not going to be strapping on any armour or slaying any giants on her way home from the cathedral this morning? Okay. How do we connect this story that just happens to be the story from the scriptures for this Sunday with uh, the, the little, little one, Elsie, who we're going to baptise? Just a couple of thoughts. Firstly, kids need to know these stories. Um, so one of the tasks of parents and godparents, one of the tasks of a parish family, one of the tasks of the religion program at the school is to make sure that the children know these classic stories. Not because we're going to go out and behead a giant, but because we need to have the confidence that in the end what is right is more important than what's powerful. There's a, there's a shaping of our mindset that comes as we tell these stories, as we teach the kids the stories. Equally important, of course, as we're nurturing Elsie and continue to nurture the two big sisters as well, is not simply to give them the stories of the past, but to teach them to look at the world with eyes that see magic, which eyes that have a delight in the wonder of the world in which we live. So we want to teach them not only to know the stories, but to read the world in which we live, and to read that world through eyes of delight and, and excitement and passion. And then there's that bit that's, that caught my eye when I first realised this reading was coming up. I was looking at the reading a week or two back and I went, oh, it's that reading. Because as I said at the beginning, the thing that has always struck me is that the, the worst thing Paul, Saul could do was actually to try and fit David out in all of his gear. It was never going to work. And one of the um, challenges for us, I guess, as we are um, nurturing Elsie, as we're helping her to grow into the future that God has for her, we, we don't put all of our baggage onto her. We don't, um, we don't, we should, there's plenty of time for her to discover the things that are difficult about the world. Let's, let's nurture and encourage that openness and that delight and that wonder at God's creation. So, um, as grown-ups, we know how complicated it is, but we don't have to load all that onto the little ones. So stand back and wait, wait until they're old enough and they're asking those questions themselves.